Good morning, everyone. We might uh, start our service before um, I do that. I haven't done this one for a long time, but we don't have to do the same way as we did it before. But I thought that just uh, during the uh, week that I was encouraged by a um, couple of locations then, and, um, and telling say that like, if you have a trouble, just look at what Tamil people do that. And one of the areas is about our church finance, and I can go more details, but I wouldn't now. And another one is that um, the church leadership position. And uh, there is a book out there now, uh, the new book about eldership, and uh, one particular minister says that that's too high bar, and what kind of, like, you know, the team that can have that kind of, like, a quality. Then I look at him and say, we have it. And I was really encouraged by um, a couple of locations. So, um, not because of that, as I come in this morning uh, with some kind of heavy hearted sometimes, that just looking at you, my heart is just, how I put it, I don't know what's the best vocabulary, and except I just can tell you that you are all beautiful. As I'm looking at you, I'm encouraged, and my heart is just, uh, how I put it, I don't know, get comfort. So, I, so, we are still in COVID, so you don't have to go around, but next to the person and look at their eyes and tell them they are beautiful. I truly believe that you are absolutely beautiful. Okay, look around. We know that we are broken people in this broken world, but through Jesus, we can tell each other that you are beautiful. What is better than this? We are tasting of heaven right now. So please stand that we're going to sing, Praise my soul, the King of heaven. So please stand.
Okay. The uh, introductory reading for today's service is from Philippians 1. Uh, one of the reasons why I chose this passage is when, I, when my brain is just um, mucked up and I can think of that <coughs> something clearly, what I do is I normally uh, choose a book and it, it happens to be always Philippians. <coughs> just to sit and the read from the verse 1 to the end of chapter. I think the reason, one of the reasons why I chose that is the book is short. <laughs> so only four chapters, but um, when I read it, just it gives me a great insight every time I read it in a different way. So I like to read from uh, verse 18 to 21. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn, turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with the full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether my life or by death. Verse 21, I think we all know that, and I think we can all read together. One, two, three. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you and praise you for who you are. In the midst of all our troubles and our busy life, that we come before you and we praise you, the King of heaven, the King of the earth. And Lord, this morning, because of your Son Jesus, that we can confess that, yes, we will praise you and we will rejoice in you. Because for to us, as a church family, to live is a Christ, to die is a gain. gain. Lord, we love you and we love our church family. And please help us to worship you this morning together in your grace and in your mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The second song that we're going to sing is Meekness and the Majesty. So please stand.
Let's give that applause, loud and strong, to the meekness and majesty. Sister uh, Robert is going to uh, give us an announcement. Okay, I'm seeing how many people I can be this morning. I'm John at the moment. <laughs> um, announcements are fairly uh, normal week, as in Wednesday with Wellbeing Wednesday, Friday, prayer meeting, TPK, etc. Uh, ladies, please don't forget the morning tea coming up only a few weeks away uh, with Karen Flanagan. Will be well worth attending. Uh, as you will notice in the bulletin, uh, Joshua Indian family are heading back to South Korea, hopefully this Tuesday. Uh, to spend time with Cindy's family, with her father and his illness and so forth. So please keep them in prayer over that time that all the arrangements will fall into place and everything that needs to happen will happen. And also for the elders during that time as we pick up preaching responsibilities and other bits and pieces. Picked and High prayer points, I would strongly commend those to you. Uh, Margaret does an amazing work at Picton High. She has such respect of the staff and the students and the families. So please be continuing to pray through the different points that Margaret uh, shared with us on the back there. And birthdays, I think we do actually have one snuck in there. Yes, we do. Helen Russell's birthday is coming up on the 25th. So let's, let's have a word of prayer for Helen. Father, we thank you for Helen. Thank you for her commitment to you and for all of the things that she's done for the church over the years. And Father, we pray that for uh, her birthday, it would be a special day that she can spend with family and friends, that she would uh, know your presence, she would know uh, your great love for her and her brothers and sisters here as well. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, changing hats. I'm now Karen Huxley. Um, Karen has been on a three-day um, outdoor education trip with the students at Southern Highlands in year 10 and 11 and upon arriving back on Friday night um, three of them have tested positive so Karen's just laying low this morning we don't think she's got it but you know yeah so pray for Karen <laughs> so uh, Karen is updating us re motor yacht and there's a couple of pictures that have been added Craig prior uh, after me finishing that I don't entirely know what's happening in the pictures but I'll just read uh, Karen's notes and yeah there's just two pictures Right, uh, what Moda Yat has been up to? Moda was invited by an organisation in partnership with the Presbyterian Church of South Sudan to teach at a training event. They organised training for Presbyterian pastors and evangelists in the northwest of Kenya. I'm assuming that's the materials and so forth that you're seeing there. During the training, Moda had opportunity to share from the Gospel of Mark. After he finished teaching, he shared the Great Commission with the trainees. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than this. I said great commission, I mean great commandment, sorry. Um, as Moda told them, there is such a great reminder. A Christian should express their love for God by loving others. This is fundamental of how believers should live out their lives. A challenge during the training event was that the evangelists and pastors came from different tribes. Many also had families who were mistreated by other tribes. So telling them to love your neighbour was very crucial to their perspective. Moda also shared with them that we can't do this on our own, but the spirit of the living God will do that in us. Sometimes loving people is not easy, but we learn through the ministry of Jesus, who loves both Jews and Gentiles. He loves people with no partiality. Such a great reminder. After the training, <clears throat> the manager asked Moda to come back again if he could do the next training course. Two of the students shared with Moda that they want to pursue theological studies and they expressed their willingness to share Jesus in their churches. Uh, family news. The family has been facing some challenges. Their little boy, Mark, has been unwell with a cough that lasted for three weeks. He's still unwell, but not as serious as before. Julia and Mark do not have health insurance and we depend on their budget when it comes to the cost of the hospital. They've also been experiencing difficulties with the process of obtaining visas for Julia and Mark so that the family can visit Australia. This is because Moda is missing some of his own paperwork. One option is for Moda to go to Australia by himself without Julia and Mark to speed up the process. He would like to reach Australia with his family, but the problem is the visa issue. So, um, some prayer and praise points. Um, they give thanks to God for little Mark. Uh, they thank God for the opportunity, uh, for the support that's been given to them spiritually and financially, and for the messages that God has provided to Moses during the teaching. 
Some prayer requests are for Mark that he'll be completely healed, for God to provide a good outcome for the visa situation, for the home assignment when they're back in Australia, for reconciliation between Eastern Upper Nile, the group with the government side and the other side, the rebel side in refugee camps, that the divided body of Christ will be united as one and Eastern Upper Nile will come together like they were before the war. Uh, pray for peace in Gambella. Last month the city uh, was in a state of unrest. There was a fight between rebels and governments and so forth. Pray for the election in Kenya, that it will be peaceful. And pray for peace in South Sudan as the peace there is still very fragile. So there's some things to pray for there. Let's pray for Mota and his <coughs> ministry. Father, we give you thanks for the work that Motor is doing around that region. Father, we pray uh, for his ongoing safety in areas that are just constantly uh, divided by conflict and war. Father, watch over him and Julia and Mark. Father, thank you for the successful uh, time he spent with these other uh, ministers and church leaders and thank you for their willingness, indeed their, their desire to go back to their churches to share your word. And we pray for those that are looking to undertake theological training that you will open the doors for that to happen and that will be a further extension of your kingdom there. Father, we pray that you would heal Mark, that he would get over this cough that's been ongoing and return to good health. We pray for the visa situation, that that would be able to be resolved and that Moda, Julia and Mark can come uh, back to Australia and that would be a very profitable time, a refreshing time for them as they, they step into that environment. And Father, just for the unrest that's been mentioned in so many parts of the country and the countries around, we do pray for your peace, uh, that you would just bring a real peace, that this war would cease, that there would be a settled time, and particularly amongst the Christians in varying tribes and varying factions, that they would be united uh, for the purpose of serving you in that country. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Thanks, John, and thanks, Karen, and thanks, Robert. <laughs> Just uh, be mindful that uh, COVID is uh, still uh, uh, around us. Um, we are going to for, uh, pray for the uh, offer tree. Before I do that, actually, I can share with you, I decided. Um, during the week, my bro I met my brother, and my brother said, he, he shared this conversation that he had a chat with someone and said that, just long story, make short, sure, the person asked, well, where is the church that actually can cover all the cost of church finances by offer tree? There's no church like that, surely. And um, my brother Isaac, younger brother, and looked at the person and said, Tamu. Look at Tamu. And, and uh, he said that to the person, said, I wish I would be in that kind of situation. And I think that there is every reason to respect your old brother. <laughs> but um, thank you for your commitment, and I will pray for our uh, op tree. Dear Lord, you are gracious and you are merciful to our lives. Lord, we took some portions of your gift to us for your kingdom, uh, for the maintenance of the church, and to meet all the financial needs. Lord, we thank you for the committee of management, and thank you for our treasurer. Lord, we pray that we continue to be faithful because you first faithful to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, first Bible reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 to 11. And uh, Heather is going to read first. Actually, that was a robot job, right? <laughs> we, we are, yeah, we are swapping around. Okay, it's 1 Timothy 1, 1 to 11. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Saviour and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths, and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons 
by serving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, is sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Thanks, Heather. So the third song that we're going to sing is Tear Out My Soul. So please stand. Time for champions. Brett and I, we, we live in the same neighborhood, and, and he goes to my 
school. I love to spend time with Brad. And he's my best friend because, you know, we like all the same things and we see each other a lot and, and we talk a lot and, and you know, we've, we've shared secrets with each other and, and you know, we've, we've been through hard times and, and good times and he's, he's just a really good friend. But you know what? No matter how much I love Brett, no matter how good of a friend he is, he's really only my second best friend, if I'm being honest. Because my very best friend is Jesus. Now, I'm not trying to just be sappy here. I mean it. Jesus is my best friend. Think about anything at all that would make for a good friend. Think of anything at all that would make someone a good friend. And Jesus does that. Jesus is my very best friend because, because he's always there for me. And nobody at all loves me as much as Jesus does. Not even my parents love me as much as Jesus does. Jesus loved me so much that he came to earth as a person. You know, he's God, but he said, come to the earth as a human. But you know, as much as I love Brett, he's really only my second best friend. My very best friend is Jesus. And he wants to be your best friend too. Let me tell you a little bit why Jesus is the best, best friend. First of all, he's always there. No matter where you are, Jesus is there too. You can't go anywhere without Jesus being there. He's going to stick with you through thick and thin. And he's never going to abandon you. He's always there to talk. He's always there to listen. He's always there to comfort you when times are hard. And he's right there with you when times are good too. And you know what? There is no one in the entire universe who loves you as much as Jesus does. Not even your parents can love you as much as God loves you. Jesus loves you so much that he came to earth as a person. You know, he's God. He could have just stayed up in heaven being God all the time. You know, it was awesome. But he decided to come to earth as a little baby and have all the same problems that you have, problems he didn't have in heaven, and came to earth so that he could die for your sins. The Bible says that greater love has no man than this, than he who lays his life down for his friends. And Jesus didn't die for you because you're awesome. You are pretty awesome, but you know what? We're being honest with ourselves. I'm not awesome all the time, and neither are you. Sometimes I can be pretty terrible, and the truth is that so can you. But the Bible says that even though you're a sinner, Jesus died for you because he loves you. He loves you no matter what. Now that is a great friend. Sometimes our friends here on earth can let us down, even a best friend, but Jesus will never let you down. And he wants to spend an eternity with you. So I have two different challenges today. One of them is for people who don't know Jesus. If you would like to know Jesus, the God who wants to be your best friend, I want you to go and find a pastor or maybe a Sunday school teacher or your parents or your grandparents or somebody that you know who is friends with Jesus Christ and ask them how you can be friends with Jesus, how you can accept the free gift that he has given to you. And my other challenge is that if you are a Christian, if you are friends with Jesus Christ, call him up, you know, not on the phone, but I want you to pray. I want you to spend time with your best friend. He is not far away, and he would love to hear from you. And he would love to spend time with you, just like a best friend would, because Jesus is the very best, best friend. So I don't know what I would say to add to that. <laughs> He will never let you down, or he will never let you go. You might have other friends that will let you down, but he will never, ever let you down. And it doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're five or six or 105, he will still be your very best friend. And he wants you to talk to him. So let's talk to him now. Dear Father, we do thank you for Jesus. We do thank you that he's the best friend we ever, ever had. And please help us to talk to him and to trust him and to always go to him when we are in need because he is the one who will always help us, who will always be with us. And I pray for each of these children today that they will help, they will always remember that Jesus is their best friend. Now that we come to um, our main prayer time, and as I normally do, I like to ask you to pray what's in your heart and your concerns, and, and I'll uh, finish in the moment of silence. So let's bow our head in prayer.
Thank you, Lord God, that you promised that you'd provide what we need and that's what you've always done. And Father, we confess that we know we are sinful people and so often, Father, you fall short of what you call us to be. But we just thank you, Father, that you continue to forgive us. And just that reminder in the video about maybe that, Lord, how hard it would be for those people to forgive. And we find it hard too, Lord, but we've got to remember what you said. You said in your word that if we don't forgive, you won't forgive. So help us, Father, to forgive in the strength that, that you give to us. And Father, we just pray for Joshua and Cindy and the family at this time. We just keep them safe, Lord, and watch over them. In Jesus' name. Father, I just um, <clears throat> bring to you this morning a beautiful couple, Elspeth and Nick, from Beecroft Presbyterian. Um, Nick is um, battling melanoma, Lord, and it's uh, it's been a very hard journey for him, but he is one of your children, Lord, and we just pray that you will continue to watch over him and be with him um, during his treatments, and uh, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you um, for your mercy and your faithfulness. I thank you that you've been watching over my sister. Who um, is improving every day. And I also pray for Kevin's mum, Pat, as she continues her treatment. Lord God, we thank you that you have given us your word, a good and faithful message and truthful to us all. We thank you, Lord, that you know, the children here this morning uh, are open to uh, and are keen to hear from your word. We also pray for not only the children in Sunday school this morning, but uh, those kids in um, Scripture uh, in the Wollongilly region who are, uh, who are hearing the Lord and, and, and making decisions. We pray for them and for the kids at Picton High and for Wollongilly Anglican, but all the kids who meet in your name. We, we thank you um, that they are free to hear uh, the gospel. And Lord, we ask that you encourage them to grow in their faith. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Father, thank you for the uh, uh, for you for the provision you give to us and the blessing you give to us. And Father, thank you for the life we live and the love and the relationship we have. And Father, just pray that um, uh, you give us the faith and the, the guidance from you, the wisdom from you, so we can uh, 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 support help the people who is uh, who are still seeking you and uh, who are still seeking for the free gift from you and father also pray for uh, for your uh, guidance that we can uh, help the uh, the children and uh, families that uh, who are um, uh, suffering at this time with uh, different uh, uh, losses Father, we just pray you give us the strength and the wisdom and your guidance. And uh, while we in that journey together with you, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just um, <clears throat> give thanks um, for uh, Joshua and Cindy and the family. And we um, pray for their safe travel to um, Korea. And uh, we just um, know that you'll be with them during this time, and uh, we pray for their safe return. Please keep them, um, protect them from COVID um, during this time. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dear Father, we bring our hearts, our prayer points, and our minds before you, Lord, 
and we have confidence that you will hear all our prayers and you will answer according to your plan and your divine time. And Lord, this, this morning I'd like to bring uh, Brooklyn, nine years old boy. Doctor gave him uh, four to eight weeks to live. But Lord, I pray that you, your healing hands on him, that whatever the doctor says or whatever the human decided, but all is according to your plan, according to your time. So we pray for him. And we pray for our church family, Lord. We continue to grow in your knowledge, grow in your love, that we will experience heavenly love, the love that we're going to spend and share uh, together in heaven, that we will bring it into this side of eternity. So Lord, please help us to do that. So please protect us and guide us and the leaders and feed us through your word that we can be the people what we meant to be here, Lord, and we can achieve the things what we meant to achieve as your son did. Lord, we thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, second Bible reading, and Alvin is going to uh, read for us. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Timothy, reading on uh, from 1, 1 verse 12 to 20. The Lord's grace to Paul. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointed me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, he honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them, you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Bless the reading, the listening, and the understanding. Um, if you are Bible readers, and I encourage you uh, what Owen did just now, um, come up this screen and you read it, because we are recording it. And, uh, one of my friends minister and uh, rang me and said, Ah, can you say hello to Trish, Louise? <laughs> used to go to church with her and I thought, she's reading your um, the Bible passage, so, so you, you never know uh, who is watching that, YouTube and... Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I encourage you to come and read the scripture so the people can see it, uh, not just only us, through the uh, online as well. Yep. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you uh, for the passage that we read. Please help us to understand. So we'll be able to apply in our lives according to your word. In Jesus' name, Amen. We embarked a new series. Last week was the introduction. 
good stewards of faith and speculative faith one. And by the end of today's uh, message, I hope to know, all of us actually know the definition of good stewards of faith and the speculative faith. And um, this passage just explains precisely. Uh, a few years back, I heard job by advertisement and I thought, well, there is no way to return. Who's going to apply? Uh, if you remember that there was a job advertisement going to the Mars. Do you remember? Mars 1 is just here. Sorry. It's all right. Do you remember that? And uh, here is uh, here is uh, news about that. Yeah. Mars One has just taken another step to bring mankind where it has never stepped before. Meet the Mars 100. Just 100 candidates now remain in the competition for a seat on a one-way trip to the Red Planet. Initially, more than 200,000 applied for the Mars One astronaut selection program from all over the world. About a year ago, that number narrowed to about 1,000. That's when we first met six of them. I wanted to go into space since I was three years old. Out of this group, just two advanced to the final 100. Layla Zucker, a married 46-year-old ER doctor from Washington, D.C., who is, well, excited. Spaceship, spaceship, spaceship! And Daniel Carey, a 53-year-old data architect from Virginia, husband and father of two. The whole impact and possibility becomes a lot more real and sharp as the numbers get smaller. It's still a long shot, so nothing has really changed. Um, it's still just uh, us, the candidate. Baz Lansdorp is co-founder of the Mars One mission and has put nearly a decade of research into it. The goal, not only to get people there by 2025, but to also televise the finalists and their training. I want to really make clear that it is absolutely not our goal to make a big brother in space. It's our goal to share the most exciting story of mankind of the 21st century in a very beautiful way with the rest of the world. Mars One partnered with Lockheed Martin, which is already building a lander to conduct experiments on the planet in 2018. However, some scientists not on board with the idea of a one-way trip and question whether Mars One will be ready for liftoff 10 years from now. I don't know that 2025 or 2030 or even 2035 are realistic, but I think it will happen. Again, you know, our human nature is to explore. But is exploring a planet millions of miles away worth leaving family behind? When asked, here's what Carrie told me last year. I do not know if I have what it will take to turn my back on my family. Uh, but this is the only thing, you know, that would make me even think about trying. And now? I had told my daughter, and she was like, I'm, I'm really conflicted because I I want to support you, and on the other hand, I really don't want you to go. And my son was a little less, you know, it's like, oh, that's that's great, Dad. And, um, with my wife, it's it's a lot more um, tense. <laughs> Wife is tense about going to one way tree. <laughs> wow. What would you do? Would you apply for the job? No. Did you hear that? How many people applied for that? 100,000 people. The men and women desire to the difficult task. And, and as you see that, they are not dumb people, they are smart people. They are doctors and architects and all that. And um, they know that it's a one-way tree. And this is a Paul's description of Christian ministry. And the Paul is a smart guy that we can see from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, from verse 21. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of, offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like madmen with the far greater labors, far more imprisonment, with countless beatings and often near death. 
and the Lord give us Christian ministry job description. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes one. What that means is if you get 40 lashes, you die. So by grace, they give 39. And Paul had that five times. And three times I was beaten with the rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night, a day, I was adrift at sea. On frequent journey, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. And 27. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. exposure. And apart from other things, there is a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who made to fall? I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God, the Father of the Lord Jesus, He who blessed forever, knows that I am not mine. Wow, this is a Christian ministry job description. Not just for the pastors, it's for every Christian. Constant attack from invisible enemy, result of your work is not guaranteed. I hate that actually. You may not see it, the result. Your full reward is not coming until you die. You need to sacrifice your home, you sacrifice your house, and you need to sacrifice your family and your life and your ambition, and your career. Then the question is, would you apply for that job? Timothy did, actually. Timothy. And this is why Paul gave him a big mission. The church wants a great church, the gospel church, going down the spiral. Paul wrote his personal letter to him to rebuild the church again. Do you remember that last week? About 80, 50, the church was planted, and 60 it was a great church, got all the compliments the possibility to have, and at the 890, the church is going downhill. Just one generation. As a young man, Timothy, he put his hands up to build the kingdom of God again. The rise of a false teaching in here and today's passage. And Paul is not actually talking about heresy in here, but wrong teaching. So what is a wrong teaching? And there is a description in here from 1 Timothy 1 verse 6. Certain persons by swerving from this have wandered away into vain discussion. Vain discussion. Please keep that in mind. And verse 19. Holding faith in good conscience by rejecting this, some have made shipwrecked of their faith. So what make that? The shipwreck of faith. And verse 15, for some have already strayed after Satan. What is that? The love of money was from speculative faith. It is from 1, 10, 1 chapter 6, 10. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And the verse 20, the knowledge. Oh, Timothy, God, the deposit entrusted to you, avoid irrelevant bubble and contradictions of what falsely called knowledge. The knowledge about the Bible can't save you. We know that, right? And it sometimes causes speculative faith without Jesus, without the gospel. Once a great loving church, now in the downward spiral. The church we saw in the book of Judges, actually. What happened to that church? How do they lose their love for God and love for each other? And this is frightening to see that. How quickly the church like Ephesus derailed like that. Big church, beautiful church, beautiful people. So, this is my question for myself lately, think about a lot. What do we need to do? to keep our church on track. When is the church no longer a church? The answer is, when it loses the gospel. When it loses the love of God. 
That happened to many churches. Ephesian church is no longer a church. Not because they don't have a knowledge about the Bible. What is a dead church? If there is no love of God, love for each other, doesn't matter whether you still exist, I call this is a dead church. No love. What are the symptoms of when you lose the gospel? You might have a still strong doctrine. You still might have a good program in the church. You might still have a big church building. If you want to find the best description of program, church, and all these big churches, and go to see Ephesian church, they have all of them. That is in the Revelation chapter 2. John said that, I know your works, your toil, and your patience and endurance, how you cannot bear those who are evil. And verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing of my, for my name's sake, you have not grown weary. You know what? They have a best discipleship program in their church, according to the biblical knowledge. That's quite amazing. In verse Two, and say this one, but I have attested who call themselves apostles and are not, found them to be false. Their biblical knowledge is just great. Then what's wrong with this church? They know all about this discipleship program and they know all about, all about the biblical knowledge and they can argue and debate, they can win. The answer is in verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Can you see this? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. So if we don't have love, it's not just a turning around, it's a repent, matter of repentance. And do the works you did at first. If not, simply, there is no reason why you exist. Because you are not the church anymore. You are not the family of God anymore. So I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless, what? Turn your way to God. Where? Gospel. I'm not saying that the discipleship program or all of these difficult things is not important. Yes, they are. But they are existing for supporting us how to love God and love our brothers and sisters in Christ. They are tools for us, can't replace the love that we have for each other. When love declines, that's the problem. So what are the mindset of false teachers? It's from verses 3 and 4. I urge you when I was going to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myth and endless genealogies endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. So that's where my um, the sermon title of the series comes. Good stewards of faith and the speculative faith. I want you to think about your faith actually this morning. Which of these two describe your faith? Speculation false teachers, vain discussion, knowledge, and the love of money into me, and into genealogy. That's interesting. Talk about interesting things in the Bible. Speculative things. Genealogy. Just genealogy is one of the examples is where did Cain get his wife? Have you thought about it? That can be hidden discussion. Where did Cain get his wife? And the lots of stuff like that is in the Bible. Names and into people. Does it really matter actually? Does it really matter? Seven exact day of creation. You can support like, you know, that has to be seven days. It has to be the earth like in you know, 4,000 years. Exact days. Or more than seven days. And if these things are impacting you, how you love God and brothers and sisters in Christ, does it really matter for your salvation, actually? 
arguing that and focusing on that. Would you be more godly than if you know where Cain, where Cain get his wife? Does it change your Christian life? Ephesians church become more interested in speculative things in the Bible than the core of the gospel. How many doctorate from the Bible actually? That if you go to uh, the library, how many doctoral papers there? I think thousands and the millions probably. You can fill up whole library according to that. But without love means nothing. What actually Bible talk about? As simple as this, as easy as this, God loves us. That's why He sent only Son Jesus, died for our sins. Then what? We love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Not the way that I want to, but the way that God wants us to. Ephesians church lost love. Do you know what does that mean? They become like a dead sea. It is still the sea, but no life in it. Speculative theology equals false teaching. Just into those random, the interesting thing in the Bible. The biblical doctrine divorced from the life, from the love of God. There is no sign of love. Still powerful church. Don't get me wrong. Those churches can be very powerful, can be big, and has lots and lots of problems. But the thing is, they are dying church. And Timothy has difficult this difficult task. He put his hands up and he says, I will do it. The leaders are moving away from the gospel and teaching something else. Metaphorically speaking, where did get Cain get his wife? That's more important stuff than the gospel. When you are digging into speculative biblical knowledge, do you know what is the best area to do it? There are lots and lots of areas, genealogies, um, Paul is talking about. There is an area actually you can go into it and you make the rules and the regulations and you can win over any conversation. And that is 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. The aim of our charge is a love that issues from a pure heart, good conscience and a sincere faith. And verse 6, certain persons, by swearing from this, and have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law. Can you see that? Desiring to be teachers of the law, without understanding either what they are saying, or the things about what they are making confident assertions. They are teachers of the law, but they don't know what they are talking about at the end. Instead of focusing on love that issues from a pure heart and good conscience and in sincere faith, instead of loving God and the brothers and sisters in Christ and forgetting about who God is, leaves, be, leaves his love behind and assumes who God is, then they focus on what? The law. And if you do that, if you do that, you always win over the conversation. You can. Become a legalistic person. Okay, you must do this way and that. Instead of grace-oriented relationship, becomes law-focused relationship. And I am not saying that the law is bad. Because the law has a purpose in this world. Law is not contradictory to the gospel. Actually, law is actually complementary to the gospel. Legitimate. What is the purpose of the law? Law is not meant for the righteous person. It's not for those who do the right things, actually. Law is for the law breakers. Keeping, keeping the law doesn't change your life at all. Okay? It's a boundary for us as a human, how we meant to live. So it's from the verse 8. Now we know that the law is good. If one uses it lawfully, understanding this, 
that the law is not laid down for, for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers and the murderers of sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality in slaves, and goes on to that. Um, when was it? 2005. 2005, when I um, finished my Bible college and study and you know, all those things, and I changed my car. The, from the car, terrible, terrible car, that always thinking about, wow, is this going? When is it going to die? And when you drive 60 kilometers per hour, it feels like 100k. You can feel it. From those cars, and I bought the good second-hand car. Then when I drive in a Parma, it's a 60 k engine. I don't feel that this is a 60 k. So I went over a speed limit. So I drove 70, but then I realized, whoa, too late. I saw the flash behind. And I, um, I broke the law by 12 kilometers. I was caught by the speed camera. And actually that was my first uh, speed camera thingy. And until now, the law, speed camera, caught me when I broke the law, okay? It's not like a speed camera exists to, to catch me how well I am driving. No, speed camera doesn't do that. It only takes your picture when you break the law. God's law is there to show us who God is, actually. How holy He is and his holy character and convict us that we are ungodly. We can't keep it. And this is what God is like. But I am not. God requires that we are holy and righteous. And the law convicts us that we are sinful and we need to be rescued. The ultimate purpose of the law is to show us who God is and how ungodly we are to show us why we need Jesus. That's the purpose of the law. If you use the law of God apart from that, and I would say that is speculative faith and teaching. That's a false teaching. It is a false teaching. That is what is happening in Ephesian church. Law is a master tool to show us why we need Jesus. That's the purpose of the law. And Romans chapter 7, if you read it, you know what? That's one of my favorite passages. Without law, we don't know we are bad people in this case. Law is good, actually. Because law directs us to Jesus and focusing on Jesus. Law reveals us that we are sinful. We need a Savior. Romans 7 verse 14. I hope that you enjoy it as we read together. For we know that the law is a spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not know what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Have you experienced that? I do a lot of times. That verse 15 says, Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the, the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I kept on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer who I do it, but sin dwells within me. The law directing us to the gospel. As simple as that, as easy as that. Law without the gospel is a diagnosis without the remedy. The gospel without the law is the good news for those who don't need a savior. Law and gospel goes together, and law never to be preached instead of the gospel. And that is what is happening at church in Ephesus. 
when you try to win over other Christians to your point of view, please, please keep that in mind, that whether you are doing the right thing or not, whether you discuss over Calvinism, whether you are talking about the public school versus Christian school, whether you are talking about the creation, whether you are talking about the genealogy, that's the case of Baptist Church. If you try to win over the conversation according to your biblical knowledge to prove that you are right, is it necessary? Whatever topic that it is, sadly, Sydney evangelicals, we can have a very heated discussion. Then my question is, is it necessary? Showing up my biblical knowledge about genealogy. I mean, the metaphorically speaking, as I mentioned today, the world is going downhill very fast. We often busy with the things to win over my point of view. That's actually how we train. Gene genealogy. Are we, are we the gospel focused people or are we into those kind of conversation? One of the regrets actually uh, what happened at the Bible College for me that is I had a very heated discussion and um, one person came into Bible College because that person is just into Christianity and I remember we were talking about Calvinism, predestination, and I won, I like to win, and I won, and I believe I broke the relationship. Then at the time, I didn't mind, but as time goes by, I regret a lot, because is it necessary to win over the things according to your mind? And I felt that I should lose sometimes. For the sake of the gospel. So whatever the topic it is, please keep that in mind. What is the most important thing? To keep the love and look after the person and growing into the knowledge of Christ, that is important. And verses 3 and 4 explain this and I like to read again. As I urge you when I was going to message and remain episodes, so that you may charge a certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myth and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than stewardship, with God that is by faith. Ephesus is a Sydney. I believe Ephesus is a town. That's what we are good at. But we are here to convict the world that we need Savior through the glorious gospel of Jesus, loving God. We have been entrusted with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. So I would like to encourage all of us, include me, that to love God, to love brothers and sisters in Christ, that is the most important thing to do. And losing your argument, point of view, that's not a matter of things for our faith. We have been entrusted with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. That is the most important thing. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you and praise you for who you are. We often derail to focus on mundane, daily, trivial things and heated discussion that I want to win. Sometimes we made that mistake. Lord, I know that I did. And we know that we did. So this time we brought that all of that before you, ask you to fix that and please help us to repent if we did it before. The world is going down you know, rapidly. 
very fast. Please help us to understand what is the most important thing in this side of eternal life. Lord, please help us to love you and love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to uh, sing Behold the Lamb, the communion hymn. So please stand.
now that we're going to uh, share a um, communion table. And this table is the table of our Lord Jesus. And it is very important for us to know that this is a reminder of what Jesus has done. And as we partake this meal together, we are confessing that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And you're showing your commitment that I will love you as God commands us. Not the way that I love you as long as I want. So please remember that. And it is like a wedding ceremony every month for us. The reminder of the covenant relationship with God through Jesus. So on behalf of the session, the leadership of this congregation, I therefore invite those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and are the members in good standing of this or another congregation to join this celebration of Lord's Supper. So let's hear the word of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart. You will find the rest for your souls. So let's listen to the, uh, the word of institution of the Holy Supper. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a bread when he had given thanks. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in worthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, it is indeed our duty and delight, always and everywhere, to give you thanks and praise. In the beginning, you created heavens and the earth, and everything in them you made us in your own image, and your tender mercies are over all your works. Mighty God, Heavenly King, we magnify and praise you with all the company of heaven. We worship and adore you, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, O Lord Most High. Blessed is the he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Almighty and merciful God, you love the world so much that you gave us your only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Lord, we share this meal as our church family come together in the unity of your Son, Jesus. Please remind us that we are your children and please remind us that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are here to love you and to love each other. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are still uh, around COVID. And uh, uh, so from this side, go to Barry. And this side, go to uh, Robert. So please stand and go and grab wine, grape juice, and the bread.
On the night Jesus was betrayed, took a bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Christ has died. Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Let us pray. Dear God our Father, You have greatly loved us and mercifully redeemed us. Now You fed us and strengthened us at Your table. Give us a grace that in everything we may give ourselves, our wills, our works, as Your continual thank offering to You. May we live in peace and fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ and rejoice together eternal, your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray the benediction. May the grace of Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Okay, time for uh, morning tea. I hope you stay and uh, have a chat and share your beautiful eye contact with each other. <laughs>